So Sabina Varayan, thank you so much for joining us today. The digital stage is now. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends of UNIC, uh, dear participants, I'm very happy and pleased uh, to be a uh, participant today uh, to this conference because I think it's uh, touching a very important issue for our future. And today I'm speaking from my home office in Aachen. Uh, I'm uh, not in Brussels at the moment because of the pandemic. And I think most of us are uh, really yeah, uh, touched by that, what's going on in all our member states. Uh, this year has truly been uh, a very uh, a challenging year and our lives are very different uh, than they were uh, uh, a year ago. Corona has changed many things in our everyday life and work, and it has led to an ad hoc digitalization. Many of us needed some time to adjust, but in the digital sector, there are even bigger uh, changes ahead because uh, what was opened up now uh, during this pandemic was that we are in many the cases, especially when it comes to digital education, uh, lacking behind that there is a big gap. And I think uh, that was shown uh, throughout uh, the experiences we made throughout the last months. The last decade has been transformative for artificial intelligence, arousing both fear and excitement for humanity. Artificial intelligence has advanced to the point that it will have such a systematic impact that it could substantially change all aspects of our society for the next century. The use of artificial intelligence raises many concerns regarding the ethics and transparency of data collection, use and dissemination. And we need to carefully assess the benefits and the risks of artificial intelligence. Whilst it is easy to understand the potential effects of artificial intelligence on sectors such as telecommunications, transportation, traffic management, healthcare, uh, evaluating its long-term effects on education, culture, and the audiovisual sector is considerably more challenging. Although there is a consensus that artificial intelligence and automation is likely to create more wealth and to simplify many processes, and the use of artificial intelligence has also raised serious concerns that it may result in an increase in inequality, discrimination, and unemployment, what we hold already. Europe must remain competitive with China and the USA, and for this reason, I think it is a good sign that uh, 84.9 billion euros are made available for the Next Horizon Europe program. Um, and after all, this will enable research funding to be further advanced in the field of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence holds many challenges that we still have to deal with, not only technically, but also morally. Technical progress must not happen at the expense of people. Therefore, it is important that the EU proceeds united. The European Parliament has presented recommendations on what EU-wide rules for artificial intelligence should look like. It is possible for the EU to become a world leader in the development of artificial intelligence, but we believe that a trustworthy AI must be a, a trademark of the EU. And we need to ensure the highest standards of transparency for AI systems. The formulas and algorithms behind AI systems must not, must not be biased. Social networks like Facebook, which challenge our democracy, must make their algorithms transparent. Overall, we need an approach that simultaneously creates legal certainty for society and companies, but at the same time leaves room for digital innovation. Today, however, I want to focus on how AI may transform the education and cultural sector in which particular regulatory challenges the union may have to face in that regard. COVID-19 has shown us that digitalization plays an important role in education, but also that some member states are much further along than others. In some EU member states, 32% of the pupils had no access to education for several months. And even where learners had access to digital education, they were often on their own, without trained teachers, without social interaction of their classmates, and sometimes also without the family support because uh, they were lacking infrastructure, they were lacking competences, and uh, it was really a difficult situation and the gap between uh, uh, pupils who were enabled to take part in uh, distance learning and those who were not uh, is rising. It is unacceptable that something like this is happening within the European Union. 
and students, their education and their future should not depend on their fam family situation. Education shapes our future. High quality education systems are also the basis of the EU's global competitiveness. That is where artificial intelligence comes into play. AI is transforming learning, teaching and education radically. The whirlwind speed of technological development accelerates the radical transformation of educational practices, institutions and policies. Personalized learning experience is the cornerstone of the use of artificial intelligence in education. It would allow students to enjoy an educational approach that is fully tailored to their individual abilities, needs and difficulties, whilst enabling teachers to closely monitor students' progress. However, in order to make personalized education a reality, large amounts of personal data would need to be collected, used and analyzed. Therefore, it is essential to ensure the safety and transparency of personal data collection. The use and the management and the dissemination will safeguarding confidentially and privacy of learners' personal data. Only then, the use of artificial intelligence in education is a possibility in the EU. We have to safeguard and to enable. But artificial intelligence is also a factor in the cultural sector. It can, for example, help preserving cultural heritage, which is threatened by climate change or conflicts. Artificial intelligence can also be used to enhance users' experience by enabling visitors of cultural institutions and museums to create personal narrative trails or to enjoy virtual tour guides. This would have been a chance for people to visit cultural heritage sites during this pandemic. Conversational bots could communicate in an interactive way about cultural heritage on any topics and in any language. They would also make the access to information easier whilst providing a vivid cultural experience to users. AI could also facilitate the understanding of the history of the European Union or other countries. It may facilitate the exploration of the cultural, economic and historical development of European cities and improve understanding thereof. Furthermore, AI holds many new possibilities for creating creative content. So we might need to think of new definition of artists and art. While AI offers a wide range of opportunities in producing high quality cultural and creative content, the centralized distribution and access to such content raises a number of ethical and legal questions, notably on data protection, freedom of expression, cultural diversity and copyright. AI could help empower many creators, making the cultural and creative sectors more prosperous and driving cultural diversity. But the large majority of artists and entrepreneurs may not still be familiar with AI tools. There is a lack of technical knowledge among creators, precluding them from experimenting with machine learning and reaping the benefits they could bring. Therefore, it is essential to assess which skills would be needed in the near future, whilst at the same time improving training systems, including upskilling and reskilling, guaranteeing lifelong learning throughout the whole working life and beyond. This is why we suggest to set up an artificial intelligence observatory with an objective of harmonizing and facilitating evidence-based scrutiny of new developments in AI in order to tackle the questions of aud auditability and accountability of AI applications in the cultural and creative sectors. So while we need to find answers and how to handle the challenges that come with the use of artificial intelligence, AI holds also many chances. I'm positive that the EU will find a balanced solution. And I appreciate to discuss that further with you and to work on a legal framework also for artificial intelligence in future that meets all the needs and the challenges, but also the chances. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Sabina Verhein. That was incredibly interesting to get this uh, more macro view of how we see digital culture and artificial intelligence meeting Europe as it heads into the future. Uh, as Americans, of course, it's also, which Julia and I both are, we're expats in Berlin, it's also quite an education to hear, uh, hear from the European perspective how you perceive these digital stacks that we're now in. Um, I have a question to start off, but maybe sure, you ahead. do. Um, and I would also please encourage, again, anyone who's listening to submit questions, and we will get to those as well. Um, my one first thought is we are we are seeing, okay, yes, there we, we are seeing physical borders tighten during the corona pandemic, but we know that meanwhile, there is this digital stack uh, borders that are also starting to develop. You have the Chinese stack, and you have the American and EU stack, and maybe you have a stack in the global south. And I wonder if how you're thinking about those kinds of borders or those kinds of protocol, specifically when it comes to, say, Spanish-speaking countries in the global south or French-speaking countries in the global south or places outside of Europe. Um, are Yeah, what is the general psychogeography of preparing a digital future for Europe's extension outside of European borders? Uh, I think first it is important that we that we develop uh, throughout Europe uh, a space uh, of of, of uh, uh, legal frameworks that that uh, meet the needs of the of the sector and the needs uh, uh, the needs of the use of artificial intelligence. Um, I think in in the end there must be uh, perhaps also an influencing uh, of other regions in the world and, and the coming together on. On, 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 on the baseline or uh, compromises on how we how we can deliver services also cross cross regional if you if we talk about world regions but um, uh, I think uh, the European Union wants to have artificial intelligence used on a value-based uh, uh, leg legislative framework uh, that that really looks uh, to the serve for people. Uh, humanity is a, is a very important uh, issue also in the, in the development of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence must serve uh, human beings, not the other way around. It's not something uh, just for itself, but it's something that should help, help people. And we don't know if in all the other regions in the world it's seen in the same way. So first we have to develop, uh, 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 comparing to our own uh, uh, values and uh, fundamental rights, uh, a framework uh, that works in Europe, and perhaps that will influence also other regions in the world uh, to think about uh, how to deal with artificial intelligence and uh, to use it in a, in a human being serving way. Absolutely. I mean, one of our experiences here in Europe, at least in, in Germany, where we're based, is that there is a very high level of education among everybody. Every Everybody that you interact with has a common basis, a common education basis. And I know in the United States, it's something that is, we're struggling with right now is, is bringing everybody up to a certain level. Among other things. Among other <laughs> things. Yeah. But anyway, it's for another conference. Recognizing reality. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, we won't open that door. Um, nope. but, <laughs> but of course, I think it's very encouraging to hear this approach to artificial intelligence as having a, a, a framework to engage with it that, that brings everybody on the same level. As a, a friend and musician, Holly Herndon, who works with AI, speaks, uh, she speaks about, it's not what artificial intelligence will do to us, it's what it will do through us. So it's very important that we have a good framework with which to work with the, with artificial intelligence. Um, so uh, I think a, a question that would maybe link this to our first keynote speaker, if you have the time, I think we have a few minutes, um, would be to say what in what ways uh, uh, Elisa. Uh, um, uh, who began this uh, talk, she spoke about how we are now using private space, uh, pr uh, private property to create civic space. And that's a big problem that we need to solve. Our, our, our commons is now on Mark Zuckerberg's front lawn and we don't want that. We, or, or we wanna find ways to work with that um, that, that are, are not privatizing our commons. What discussion are you having right now uh, with the other European Union nations to create civic spaces in digital space? Uh, I don't know how far we are in this discussion, uh, uh, because, uh, uh, as I said, uh, the digitization is 
in some areas just starting. When I just take a look how we work uh, uh, in the European Parliament, uh, we had to adapt very quick instruments of uh, exchange new spaces of, of, for committees, for uh, uh, plenary meetings and so on, people uh, um, sitting at home, sometimes in their bedroom, uh, making uh, public public meetings. <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult for, so, for some to really to, to realize and recognize that they are now public and <laughs> opening up their own, their own spaces. And I think it has a lot to do uh, first with the education, with sensibility, with awareness rising, what's going on now in such times? Uh, do we need uh, 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 spaces um, uh, where we can meet publicly and not open up our private issues? It's important also to secure private privacy. Uh, that is something that's very important for us. We don't want to, to have everything controlled, also not controlled by platforms. We don't want a supervision of um, uh, uh, platforms and electronic tools of all our lives. I think it's very important to keep uh, the right uh, to a private environment, the right uh, to personal data, the right to, to say yes or no. I think that is something we did already in the past, uh, that we wanted to get transparency in what is done. And I think that's the, the key in the end, that we need a, a transparent information about what is done on the digital uh, uh, in the digital space. Also, when it comes to artificial intelligence, transparency is, is to me the clue because then I can make, uh, let's say, a, 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 a responsible decision, what I want, what I don't want, where I want to go. Um, uh, coming to a public space, uh, what we are thinking about uh, uh, or what the European Commission is thinking about and we are, are supporting that is uh, when it comes, for example, to education, to build up um, a platform where you can exchange, for example, learning materials, digital education materials that are the kind of, of space. And, and there we also would need in future artificial intelligence for uh, uh, translation tools, for example. To, 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 to adapt this material uh, that uh, perhaps comes from Estonia uh, to other languages. Um, there are so many uh, parts where we really need also public space and public room um, uh, where everyone has access to, where we can use information. And, uh, um, but the, all these things must be done in a, in a, in a transparent and open way uh, so that we uh, really have a public environment that is on the one hand open, but on the other hand also safe when it comes to, to personal data and personal information. So everything that is put in in such a public space uh, must be anonymized and uh, should not be um, uh, in a way uh, that privacy is not uh, secured. That's very interesting and encouraging. I, I wonder what challenges you then see uh, might arise when, when finding common ground with say China or America or Russia or other places that have a different uh, regional protocol for digital transparency? Uh, I think that are things we have to, we have really to discuss perhaps also when it comes to, 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 to trade agreements and other things. Um, uh, we saw in the past that uh, we are influencing each, each other. Uh, it was in the past when it came, for example, uh, to uh, uh, measures for people with disabilities, where we, when, when one country starts to safeguard something, others follow up because people, people uh, uh, give, are giving pressure, uh, uh, perhaps also in other countries. When it's possible in one, it might be also possible in the other region. And I think uh, the future will show where we find common ground, uh, but um, as the systems are very, very different. Uh, when it comes, for example, to freedom of expression and other things. I don't see at the moment that we find in every uh, single uh, aspect of artificial intelligence a common ground. Um, but I think uh, we can discuss on where we have common, common approaches and where we can collaborate and where we ha have to keep our differences because of the difference of the systems. Yeah. Uh, one extremely important aspect of uh, AI and machine learning is the data sets uh, it uses to learn and it, it is built upon. And uh, I wonder if there's uh, any uh, steps or ideas, undertakings that uh, you're thinking of on a, a government parliamentary level 
uh, or regulatory level that uh, manages or uh, looks towards using non-biased or rich, accurate data sets uh, when building machine learning, AI, et cetera. And Didn't you say Siri was actually built on the... <laughs> so Siri and Alexa was built on a, a, a big uh, cache of emails that was actually released to the public during the Enron corporate <laughs> scandal of the early 2000s uh, in, in the United States. So uh, Siri, uh, your Siri and Alexa... Uh, actually was uh, taught by with a corrupt uh, executive. So you might want to watch them while you're sleeping. You might, <laughs> Terry might steal empty your, your bank uh, account. Yeah, empty your bank account or something. But, but as European Union, you must have um, a, a more a, a more clear, transparent way of going about this. Is there anything in place already in terms of thinking about data sets that would train AI in Europe? Yeah, we are. Uh, uh, the the uh, legal committee is discussing in its uh, uh, and, and also the the, the legal committee is discussing on this in their initiative report on artificial intelligence. Um, uh, we in cult committee are just we just had to tackle the, the issues of education and cult because we have these competences in the in the European Parliament of committees. We were not allowed to to touch the other competences. Uh, but if you if you take all the uh, initiative reports that are made in artificial intelligence, you get a, a, a full picture on uh, what we are thinking about and in which direction it might, might go. And I think uh, what is very important when it comes to data collection is uh, 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 depersonalized data so mm -hmm. that you can work with data, but uh, uh, you have to uh, first uh, those uh, uh, people, uh, the people have to decide themselves which data can be used or which not. I think the decision-taking process must be with the user, uh, which data is taken and analyzed and uh, uh, structured and used for, for artificial intelligence. On the other hand, uh, uh, we uh, need uh, an anonymization of the, of the data when it comes to, to the elaboration. When it, uh, difficult it, it will be when you need the personality for offering structured information, or when it comes, for example, to education uh, software or education uh, um, uh, ed educational tools, where you need the person as such in what what is able to do uh, the, the 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 child uh, that has a learning process, and you have to analyze on basis of such processes, and then to offer a child something. Um, there is, uh, uh, you can anonymize the data to collect the mass of data and to elaborate uh, learning structures and learning systems. But in the moment when it comes uh, to offer a special offer to one person, you again have the, the personalized structure. And there we need safeguards, there we need uh, data protection rules that make clear uh, from which moment the data uh, has to be protected and which kind of data you can use also to develop new, new tools and, and uh, further uh, learning st steps. And there we need a clear difference between um, uh, uh, the different parts of use and the different kinds of use that are there and clear rules that makes it easier for uh, uh, developers who are developing AI tools uh, for the different sectors uh, to, to know exactly what, what's okay, what's not okay, um, and to, to, to get rid of these gray zones uh, in which you might develop uh, wonderful tools, but uh, which are difficult when it comes to responsibility for each uh, uh, single person. Yes. Thank you. Um, one, maybe last question, or do you have uh, another question as well? A question from, how are we on time? Uh, oh, yes. Well, maybe we can do two final quick questions then. One is, and, and this may be a competence that's outside of your region, but um, I know some artists, um, because of course the music industry and um, the art industry have been compromised by the, the, the digital shift over the, the past 20 years, let alone COVID, um, have been thinking creatively about blockchain and uh, different kinds of crypto um, DAOs or different ways of distributing resources through, I don't know, different kinds of crypto instruments. And particularly, uh, we know since we're living in Berlin, there's a very creative relationship to blockchain. It's not just about financial speculation. It can oftentimes be about making sure that artists uh, receive um, the right kind of compensation for the work they're doing in perpetuity. Um, you don't have to get into detail, but just in general, is blockchain something that's on your radar? Um, is it being discussed yeah. in the European Union? And is it being discussed 
discussed in terms of artist relations and uh, supporting artistic or cultural communities? I think the blockchain technology uh, offers a lot of opportunities and possibilities uh, to develop uh, uh, the right tools uh, uh, and uh, to to work on this, I don't know if it's uh, uh, in the in the mind of uh, of the of the Commission uh, when it comes to education or to cultural aspects, but as, uh, when it comes to financial issues, to other services, when it comes to 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 uh, uh, energy uh, uh, delivery and other things, blockchain plays already a big role. But I think uh, this technology can also uh, be an instrument for other sectors like the cultural and creative sector. And uh, when the commission is not thinking about that, we should make them thinking about it. It would be very interesting to hear their thoughts. Thank you. I think we have one last question. Um, Uh, There's a question here, here, and I also have a question. Okay, uh... so I guess related to art, in your opinion, this is coming from in from our Facebook. So um, uh, in your opinion, does the digitalization of art democratize its access? Or are there dangers that art might become elitist? I guess just in general, what gatekeeping role does digitization play with art for better or worse? I guess it's also a question of a digital divide between right. uh, I guess artists a- and access. And I, I believe you mentioned something about a, a helping to increase access of uh, AI to artists. And maybe there's a bit more detail about that if you're able to share. Mm. Uh, first, it is uh, when it comes to 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 making uh, uh, art better accessible uh, for people has nothing to do directly with artificial intelligence. First, it's just uh, the digitization, and then we had many projects to open up uh, the sphere of of art uh, to more people to help uh, also in the question of copyright to 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 uh, make works accessible, which are in museums uh, where the right holder are not. Uh, uh, found or other things we try to open up always under the respect of intellectual property but to uh, to help also museums to to become more digitized when it comes to um, the question of access to artificial intelligence tools or te- technologies uh, for artists uh, I think uh, there a big uh, a challenge lies in education and also adult education and lifelong learning structures. And I think uh, uh, digital uh, structures must be part, uh, more and more part of uh, adult learning or lifelong learning concepts. Because uh, when you are born uh, in the dig- already in the digital age, if you are a digital native, um, uh, most of, of the young people have a natural access to digital tools. But not all of the artists we have today or the musicians have really, um, let's say, a census for, for these possibilities. I just talked to some artists in my region and uh, uh, they were forced now to work with digital tools in a different way uh, than they were before. And they said, it's, it's quite new for us. We have to learn that. We have to to adapt that and uh, there is not really someone who teaches us and helps us to come to that. So I think uh, what should be one focus in the next years also of the exchange programs or the uh, education plans Uh, We have this digital education plan in Europe and um, it's not just educating pupils in schools and educating uh, engineers and uh, uh, setting on STEM and informatics, but it's it's also that we need in the lifelong learning process, uh, skilling and reskilling of people um, in, uh, uh, in the lifelong learning process, especially when it comes to digitization. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, last question. Yeah, in terms of uh, education related, I mean, ultimately, in terms of platform adoption, it it oftentimes ends up being user, the user's choice. And sometimes the vast majority of users choose a platform that doesn't treat uh, data or or privacy responsibly. And I'm wondering uh, if there's uh, initiatives to uh, for uh, maybe perhaps media and algorithmic literacy education, perhaps lifelong uh, education in these areas that might encourage a a culture in Europe of users themselves making more responsible or better choices uh, in terms of the platforms they use. Media literacy is one of the issues we are always uh, asking for. Uh, when it comes uh, uh, to the responsibility of the member state. When it comes to school education, 
the single member states are responsible. We just can motivate and help and support member states to do more in this sector. And that is what we do uh, already since a few years uh, that we say media literacy is very important. Also, when it comes, you know, this discussions from uh, from the US, I think quite well when it comes to discussions on fake news and other things uh, to raise awareness. Uh, what's going on in the digital uh, uh, environment, what's going on there uh, on the platforms and um, also to help people to understand uh, how they can uh, defer between uh, uh, different offers, how they can uh, 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 yeah, um, evaluate is this a source of trust or uh, should I be more careful? And I think this is, this is very, very important to do that in education, but I see it more and more also with, with, with uh, uh, grown-ups, with elderly people throughout the, the process. Some are distancing from digital tools because they don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. That's the, the one thing I, I, I see, uh, especially with older people that they say, oh no, I, I don't feel um, sure if I'm doing the right thing. And so I don't do it. On the other hand, you have people who are not thinking about their personal data protection and just clicking on, I agree, I agree, I agree on nearly everything. And that's the reason why we um, have to, to to take a look where lies the responsibility, what we what can we allow? I think the first step, what, what we did was to give the possibility to an agreement. That was also a step we have done, uh, I think in the European Union first, that you had to agree all the time. I know meanwhile people who say, oh, it's so, 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 so boring. If, if you open up one page, you always have to agree on the cookies and on this and on that. But I think that's important to show um, what's going on and uh, what kind of data is, is, is used and uh, where you find it. And even then, uh, there are different uh, um, uh, uh, platforms or browsers who show exactly how many uh, uh, companies and sub-companies and sub-contracts uh, uh, are there for the use of data. And yes. sometimes you are really wondering how many people have access to your browser data. And uh, if you combine that with other data that might be available from other platforms, normally you can uh, reconstruct the whole profile uh, uh, very simply. And, and, and I think uh, that is something we have to raise much more awareness um, and to make uh, people yeah, um, to, to bring them to the possibility to take a responsible decision themselves. Yes. That doesn't mean that everyone will be uh, uh, in the situation that they can do it, uh, because not everyone wants to know it, not everyone uh, uh, wants to be educated in this field. I think there is also uh, a kind of, of, of need for protection uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for those who don't know what's really going on, but that must be a minimum protection not to block uh, every possibility, but there must be the possibility of a self-decided uh, use of data or not. Yes, absolutely. And as we said in the beginning of this conference, it should fall to the cultural agencies to teach us about this new digital culture and what the protocols are and what the dangers are. And so I think it's so encouraging that Europe, the European Union, is taking this on as a serious issue of education. Um, we might just need to move here <laughs> permanently. <laughs> In any case, I don't want to take up too much of your time, Sabina Verheyen. Thank you so much for joining thank us you. today. Um, Sabina Verheyen, the uh, Chair of Culture and Education Committee of the European Parliament. We are very curious to see what you'll be doing in the coming year, um, as I'm sure many of the programs initiated during COVID will come to fruition. Um, so uh, thank you. I think we will uh, now, uh, you have the rest of your afternoon and we can uh, discuss the very interesting things that Sabina Verheyen has shared with us in the discussion space throughout the rest of this week. Thanks and bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao. <laughs> okay, that was super interesting.